All right, thank you very much for the introduction, Maria, and thanks to the organizers for this amazing opportunity. This is a fantastic group of people, and I've had many enjoyable conversations uh, during the two days that I've been here. Today I'm going to be talking about these two recent works, one that was put out, uh, I think, a month ago, and the other one that is going to be on archive tomorrow. And it's essentially about a unified theory for barren plateaus for deep parametrized quantum circuits. So a little bit of an outline. I don't have to introduce variational quantum computing to this crowd, so I'm going to go very quick here. I'm going to do a casual stroll through the history of barren plateaus to review what is it that we know, how we can unify some of those results with this Lie algebraic perspective, and how can we go a little bit beyond this theory, and then a little bit of an outlook. So variational quantum computing, we all know the spiel here. We have a quantum computer. We assume that it's limited in its size and the depth of the circuits that it can run. So the idea is that we want to try to pair it along with a classical computer in this hybrid optimization loop where I give some problem that I want to try to solve and I encode it into an optimization task. I'm going to be talking generally about like variational quantum computing as this sort of like abstract things that contains quantum machine learning and standard variational quantum algorithms. So the next thing that I should say is that I'm going to be solely considering loss functions that take this form or that are based on this. So if you have multiple states because you have a data set, if you have multiple measurements, I'm still going to consider that they're composed from these basic elements. So this is going to be at the center of what I'm going to be talking about. The next assumption that I'm going to make is that the two norm of the measurement operator is upper bounded by 2 to the n, which happens for instance like VQE. You just kind of normalize your operators if you're measuring a poly, a projector. Because otherwise, you know, and I think Zoe is going to be talking about this, that why don't I solve barren plateaus by multiplying my measurement operator by 2 to the n? Zoe will tell you why that doesn't work, so I'm going to have this assumption right here. Okay, so let's think about why do we want to talk about barren plateaus. So if we think a little bit about the story of classical neural networks, those went through some periods of stagnation or winters, you know, from like developing the single perceptron and realizing that then we had to go to multi perceptron networks and we didn't know how to train them, back propagation came online. And during those times, they're like big winters, right? So we want to try to ask the question, is quantum neural network winter coming, right? And can we foresee that? Can we do something to prevent it? And essentially what I'm interested in is trying to see if we can provide guarantees on certain performance of our variational quantum computing schemes. And for me, I'm going to be talking about trainability or the ability to take a set of parameters and obtain a new set of parameters that, um, that is going to take us closer to the solution of the problem. The second reason why I care about this is because of this right here, where I think that we are in this moment where we just kind of take quantum computing, machine learning, and we just kind of slap them together and see what we can do with those. And we really need to be careful about just trying to do this. And fun thing, this is a Z2 symmetric meme. You can also just take quantum computer, slap it into classical machine learning, and call it a day. So first, let's begin with this review of Baron Plateau and their sources. Again, this is the basic framework. And the other thing is that I will study loss concentration. So how much is a loss function concentrated around its mean? I know that a lot of people work with partial derivative concentration. You don't really have to do that. This is Google's fault, and I blame them, and I will blame them forever because <laughs> Working with loss concentration is much easier. And if you prove that your loss function is concentrated, your gradients have to be concentrated. Working with loss function concentration and not partial derivative is so much better. And they can actually be proven to be equivalent. So then I essentially want to talk about these kind of like good practices that we've developed in the field and just see how we've come to this kind of like conclusions, like global observables, you know, those that are acting non-trivially on all qubits are untrainable or if we have too much entanglement in your state, this will lead to a barren plateau, or that we can't really train deep circuits because they have barren plateaus. I want to review these good practices and show that they are all false, or at least partially false, and explain why it is that we've come to a lot of conclusions because we've done architecture-specific analysis and taken lessons that we've learned from very specific settings and kind of generalize them to other settings. But this is not generally true, and what we're trying to do is unify those and try to get like, the real answer as to what are the sources of barren plateaus. So first, what is a barren plateau? From a mathematical perspective, is whenever your variance of the loss function partial derivative, I think I put those the other way around. No, no barren plateau, sorry. What do I call not having a barren plateau? 
whenever the loss function has a variance that decays at most polynomially with the number of qubits. This means that if I randomly initialize in the landscape, I can use either gradient-free or gradient-based methods and likely be able to find the global minima or maxima of my problem. Now, if I have a variant plateau, the loss function, its variance is going to be exponentially small with the number of qubits. And that means that whenever I randomly initialize, if I want to find a loss minimizing direction, I'm going to need an exponential number of shots to find it. And hence, I'm not going to be able to train. So of course, variant plateaus are a precision issue. You know, This is exactly why, for us in the quantum community, I believe that there is such a big issue. So from here, uh, let's start with perhaps the most well-known source of variant plateaus, which is due to the expressiveness of the circuit, or what I like to think about, there is no free lunch in quantum machine learning. There is not one ansatz to rule them all, you know. And the whole point is that in this seminal paper from Google, they take a quantum circuit that forms a two design. Uh, we've already heard from Jens the definition of a two design, which is, a, in this case, a circuit that whenever I'm sampling parameters, I'm sampling unitaries, and those unitaries uh, have moments, uh, have a distribution whose moments match those of the hard measure of the unitary group up to the second moment. That was a mouthful. And what they showed is that in this case, if you compute the variance, you can use the Weingarten calculus, a little bit of representation theory, and you get to this result right here. So what we can see here is that we've already assumed that this guy is upper bounded by 2 to the n. OK, so maybe if this is 2 to the n, it's a traceless operator like a poly. I just cross this out. This 2 to the n kills 4 to the n, and I just get 2 to the n. But then I have the trace of rho, which is upper bounded by 1. So what I see here is that I'm going to have a barren plateau for any initial state and measurement operator that I can take. So the expressiveness of the circuit essentially leads to this prefactor right here. And this realization that maybe here the problem is that my circuit is too expressive. Expressive in the sense that it's generating too many unitaries, covering too much of the unitary group, can be formally generalized by thinking about, I have a parameterized quantum circuit. I fit in a set of parameters that gives me a set of unitaries. And I can just look at what is the accessible space of the unitary group that I'm filling whenever I'm sampling parameters for my group. And one can rigorously show that the more expressive your circuit is going to be, the more concentrated the loss function is going to be. Such that if you have a circuit that maybe this is very specialized circuit, you know, it has a lot of inductive biases, it can only solve problem A, it might or might not have a barren plateau. But if I have a very expressive circuit that maybe contains a solution to a bunch of problems, this is pretty much guaranteed to have a barren plateau. Yes? Uh, have you ever considered that the trace of O to the square that the O can have like <coughs> exponential number of poly terms? So then these things can, the trace of O squared can be very large, actually. Can so, be even for instance, it depends on your normalization, right? Like a projector. A projector, if you expand it in polys, is exponentially many terms, but it's normalized, so it's trace squared is equal to 1. So most practical scenarios, like I measure a polynomial number of Pauli operators, like VQE or QAOA, those will satisfy that condition. Uh, if you have projectors, that will also satisfy that condition. So most reasonable algorithms, I can't really think of something where I'm going to have to estimate an exponential number of terms and it's going to go away from one of the cases considered here. But if you have some ideas, I'd be really interested of hearing like specific cases. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the question. So this is kind of this idea that if I have circuits that are too expressive, I'm not going to be able to train them, and they're going to lead to barren plateaus. Then we can think about what happens if I don't want expressive circuits. Let me actually consider the most inexpressive circuit that I can actually do, which is non-trivially acting on all qubits, which is just general single qubit rotations in each one of the qubits. And here what we can see is that if we measure some global operator, like Z tensor N, global again is acting non-trivially in all the qubits. Yes. Independent theta in each. It's independent theta it's on each one. It's not in the symmetric subspace. Sorry? It's not in the symmetric subspace. It's independent thetas. You have N thetas. I have N different thetas, yes. Oh. You can actually make it with the same, and I'm pretty sure that you're going to. No, with the same, it's actually going to be fine. Yeah, no, this is independent ones on each one of them. And here, if you compute this variance, you know, it's a little bit of linear algebra, a couple of integration of cosines, and you're going to see that this also concentrates, right? And the problem here is that we're taking objects that live in exponentially large Hilbert spaces, like my initial state and this measurement operator, and I'm trying to compute some measure of, of overlap between them, given by the inner product, which in this case is going to be the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product between 
this state and this operator, and that's bound to be exponentially small, right? So then we can ask the question, what if I take a local measurement, you know? So we already know that measuring global operators maybe is bad. What if I measure a local operator? Well, in this case, we can compute the variance and we get this result right here. It's already way more promising. And we can see, for instance, that if my input state is the all zero state, this is just one, and I get like one, one six, and I don't have barren plateaus, independent of the number of qubits. But of course, if we replace this and we say we take a local measurement, but what if rho is very entangled? For instance, what if it satisfied a volume law of entanglement? Then you can see that this term right here is gonna be an issue because if the purity of this state is exponentially close to one half, then this can be exponentially small. So for instance, that's what happens if I have an initial state that satisfies a volume law of entanglement. I'm going to have a barren plateau, even if I have very inexpressive circuit and local measurements. So of course, this is gonna be an issue, the initial state, because when we think about classical uh, quantum machine learning for classical data, where I have to take classical data, put it inside of a quantum state, I might use an encoding scheme that is generating very highly entangled states, even without me noting, right? Because it's kind of hard to realize how much entanglement we might be realizing during this uh, data embedding scheme. So untamed entanglement can also be bad. So you know, this thing that we like for quantum computing or we think that it might be a resource, it can also be a problem. And of course, there is noise. We also know that if we have large amounts of noise, the features of our landscape are gonna decrease and my whole landscape is gonna become flat. In this case, it's even worse than the other barren plateaus because the other barren plateaus have a solution. There is still like a global minima somewhere. This is just essentially killing off everything, right? So up to this point, this is kind of like the state of barren plateaus that we had where we had a lot of architecture-specific analysis. And we're saying, if you take this specific circuit with this specific gate placement and these assumptions, this is what we can prove. And we kind of identified expressiveness, entanglement, and locality as sources of barren plateaus. And the question is, these kind of seem to be, a lot of times, not directly related. And we've studied them for different types of circuits. But can we understand them from a single perspective? And this is what we were trying to do. And we realized that we can understand different sources of barren plateau and the, pay, the price that we have to pay is that we need to do a little bit of Lie algebraic theory. So the assumption that I'm gonna make for now is that my unitary can be expressed in this form where I have an exponential of parametrized evolutions with some set of Hermitian operators, HL. I'm going to say that those Hermitian operators are taken from some set of generators. You can think about this either are the available generators in your device, or maybe just a subset of those that I picked to make my circuit. And the thing that we need to construct, and this is the central element for our theory, is what we call the dynamical Lie algebra, which is take all the elements of this set and take their Lie closure, which is just start doing nested commutators between all of them and check every time that you do a commutator, I get a new operator, I check if it's linear or independent from the rest. If it isn't, I put it in the bag and I start doing commutators with everyone else. And this is of course going to be a subspace of the whole operator space. Note that I'm doing an S here because I'm not putting global faces into my unitary. And the DLA is very important, first of all, because we know that any unitary that I can ever produce with this circuit is going to belong to the Lie group associated with this Lie algebra. And this is true for any theta and any depth of my circuit L. And the reason to see this intuitively is that let's think about this unitary as just having two layers, like exponential of two things. Well, we already know from the BCH formula that I can always rewrite this as the exponential of a single element, and here you can already start to see that you get nested commutators. There should be like dots, 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 because this is an infinite sum. So this idea of nested commutators and expressing the unitaries as a single exponential of something that belongs to the Lie algebra starts to make sense once you see it from this BCH formula. And second, the dynamical Lie algebra is important because it kind of quantifies what, the, what is the ultimate expressiveness of my quantum circuit. If I have a quantum circuit that is very deep, I know that making a small change of this quantum circuit um, is going to have at most as many directions as the, as the dimension of this dynamical Lie algebra. And you can think about this from what is the relationship between the Lie algebra and the Lie group, which is the tangent plane and identity. And the number of directions that I have available are given by the number of elements in this Lie group. So the dynamical Lie algebra already quantifies, in a way, the expressiveness of my quantum circuit. So 
let's consider examples of dynamical Lie algebras. If we have a circuit, a circuit which contains single qubit rotations, you know, around the z and y axis, and they are independent, you can see that the fact that I have an i here means that I'm doing independent rotations. And if I repeat this multiple times, I want to ask what is the Lie algebra associated with the circuit. It's not too hard to see that this is going to be a direct sum of n SU2s, where each SU2s is just essentially the local algebras that I'm going to get in each one of those. Then what happens if I have a match gate circuit, which is composed, for instance, of rotations around the z-axis, and x, x entangling gates like this? Well, the algebra is going to be a representation of SO2n. I'm going to be very, I'm going to abuse notation, and I'm not going to make distinctions between representations and algebras for now, but there are some subtleties here where the algebra is not SO2n. It is a given representation of SO2n, and we need to figure out which one it is. But for now, let me just talk about it in this way. So match gate circuits, people also call them like free fermionic circuits or linear optics circuits, and they have this small dimensional algebra. And the size of elements here is n squared. So you know, if you start this and you start making nested commutators, you're not going to be able to generate all four to the n minus one operators. If we have an universal circuit, we can take this one right here. We can add rotations around the y-axis, and after a lot of math, you can prove that you can generate every possible operator in operator space, right? So, so this would be examples of three different, al three different circuits and their associated Lie algebras. So why is the dynamical Lie algebra important? First of all, because we had some work where we started studying how barren plateaus were connected to the dynamical Lie algebra, and we had a conjecture that the variance had to be somehow proportional or inversely proportional to the dynamical Lie algebra's dimension, so that circuits with small dynamical Lie algebras maybe didn't have barren plateaus, and circuits with very large, very expressive dynamical Lie algebras, those had to have barren plateaus. And we tried to prove this, and we actually were able to do it. And in a very classic QIP-induced deadline, there were two papers in the span of four days that actually proved the same conjecture. This one right here is by the JP Morgan team. I know that JP Morgan might not be in people's radar. Pay attention to what they're doing. They're actually doing like very solid work in QML. They have like really good results. So, you know, we were like very surprised by this to see that this dynamical Lie algebra ideas had been like getting into the community zeitgeist. And we actually had talked to, I had given a talk at JP Morgan maybe a year ago, and I mentioned the conjecture as an open problem. I don't know if that was a good idea in hindsight, but. You know, <laughs> I'm happy that other people are working on this, jokes aside. So what is it that we were able to prove in this circuit? And just a couple of comments between these two. I highly encourage people to read both of them. They work with partial derivatives. We work with loss function concentration, while the formulas that we get are the same. Their paper is very mathematical in the sense that they look at a lot of examples. Ours is very conceptual, as I'm going to tell you about in a second. So. Let's start by reviewing a couple of things and making a couple of definitions. And I swear to God, there's not going to be a lot of more new math after this. So let me just define an arbitrary subalgebra of SU2n. And let me give you a Hermitian basis of this algebra. I'm going to define the L purity. I actually don't know if this is an L. I hope it is an L. I'm going to call it an L. I'm going to call the L purity of an operator as take the operator project it into this basis, and then just take its norm squared. So this projection, you can always think about take h, expand it in a basis of operator space, and just keep the operators that are in the L subalgebra, and then take those coefficients and add them up squared. I'm going to call this the L purity. And you can see that the standard purity just corresponds to L being, well, actually, this should be like a subalgebra of u2 to the n. And that would be standard purity, which is just the trace of an operator squared, right? Then let me recall that given any dynamical Lie algebra, at least the ones that we work with, which are matrix algebra, they're going to be compact, et cetera, et cetera, we can always decompose them as a direct sum of simple algebras and perhaps some abelian component. This is something general that we can always do. And a lot of the work of dealing with this formalism is actually getting to this expression right here, given your circuit's generators. And let me assume that either my measurement operator or the initial state belong in the algebra, which is the case, for instance, in QAOA, VQE, and VEQ, oh god, um, and a lot of QML implementations. 
And let me assume that the circuit is deep enough so that it's gonna form a two design over this group, and Michael was able to provide a really nice theorem which tells you exactly how many layers you need for this to be approximately true, so we can quantify this. Uh, again, we have bounds for the depth of the circuit. Then we can find this really nice expression where we can exactly compute what is the expectation value of our loss function. You can see that it only depends on the abelian component, which kind of makes sense, and the variance has this really nice formula right here. Yes? Um, what if it's an epsilon 2 design? Do you get an epsilon appearing? Yes. Yes, you're going to be epsilon in, norm, in distance to this. Um, so when we have this, we can see that the dimension of these guys starts appearing here, which is exactly what we were after. And what's really nice about this is that this is an exact formula for the variance. We're not providing upper or lower bounds. We're just telling you exactly what this is going to look like. And you can see that you get the purity of your measurement operator and your initial state in each one of the components of the algebra, the simple ones, not the abelian. You can see that this ranges from 1 to k minus 1. So let's start looking at this. Let's take the, simple, the simplest example where the algebra is simple and non-abelian. And we're going to have expectation value equals to 0. And the variance just takes this really, really nice form. So now we can see that we are going to have a barren plateau if any of those conditions are met. I have a very large Lie algebra, a very small g purity of my initial state, or a very small g purity of my measurement operator, then I will have a barren plateau. And let's try to understand each one of those, because we can readily identify three sources of barren plateaus. The first one is the expressiveness as measured through the dimension of the algebra. This is what we conjecture, and we can analytically prove it now that larger algebras are going to have smaller variances. And if I have an exponentially large algebra, there's pretty much nothing that I can do. Deep versions of this circuit, and again deep because I need to be a two design over my Lie group, are going to be always untrainable. Then this thing right here, we're going to call it generalized entanglement. And I don't know if this was like a little bit of foreshadowing or a lot of serendipity, but we didn't propose this as generalized entanglement. This was a quantity that was proposed in 2003 and 2004 by Marnum and collaborators at Los Alamos, Rolando Soma and Lorenz Aviola included. And they propose this thing as a measure of generalized entanglement. So what do I mean by generalized entanglement? Let's think about operator space again. And let's take a step back. What is a standard notion of entanglement? For instance, I can take a subset of operators in operator space. I project, for instance, my initial state in this guy. I'm going to get the reduced state on the first qubit. And then I take the trace of that. And that's just the trace of the reduced system on qubit 1. And it's a measure of entanglement. But I can generalize this notion of I can take any set of operators that live in operator space, project down there, and define a measure of entanglement with respect to this set of operators. If it's a subalgebra, even better, we have nicer properties. Um, for instance, if it's a subalgebra, we know that this is maximized for a highest weight state, which is a simultaneous maximal eigenstate of all the elements in the Cartan subalgebra. And they've shown that this guy right here can actually be used in condensed matter applications to detect phase transitions and whatnot with respect to the, re to the algebra associated to the problem that you're solving. So that was really nice. Yeah. Small remark. I mean, if rho is not pure, this is not a measure of entanglement, right? Uh, it depends on what it, That's why I call it like generalized entanglement, because it's not standard. It's completely classical correlations with it, nothing to do with entanglement. So again, like, yes, because entanglement is usually defined with the subsystem decomposition of your Hilbert space. This has nothing to do with it. It's not, it doesn't have to do with subsystem decomposition. So I can no longer talk about entanglement between this and this. That notion no longer holds. It's, it's a little bit, I've been like raking my brain. No, 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 no. This, this, part, this, this part I like. I just, for the first part, tracing out everything except for the first system, the density matrix of that doesn't tell you anything about entanglement unless rho is pure. Right. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Sorry, I'm assuming that rho is pure. Because if it's mixed, yeah, 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 of course. Um, entropy will work whenever you have like pure states. Otherwise, it's not a measure. Unless we consider that all mixed state is entangled with some environment. But I think we're going to get into other interpretations. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Here you need a pure state. And finally, we're going to define this thing as a measure of the generalized locality of O. And we're going to say that an operator is local. If I project it down into the algebra and I get O, and it's going to be non-local if this thing right here is smaller than the trace of O squared. 
And again, this is maximized for an operator in the dynamical Lie algebra. So if we revisit previous examples, we take this circuit right here, we look at what is the G purity, and we realize that, oh, you know, this can actually be written in terms of the standard purity minus the component in identity. So these guys right here, I'm going to assume a Pauli operator at this point, so that this guy right here, actually, I don't need to. And we exactly recover the Google formula in a couple of steps. If we take this local measurement, now we know that our operator, if I'm measuring like Z1, it just belongs to the first SU2. And in this case, we recover the same formula and generalize entanglement equals to the standard entanglement because the algebra is local and it kind of matches the decomposition of the Hilbert space. But of course, this is kind of tricky because it's, this is generally not going to be true. Can I and, ask a question for that last formula which was just there? Yes. If rho is in IG, yes. but O is not, yes. you project onto IG and get then the same formula? Uh, if yes. they're both outside, I, I don't know what happens. We'll get to there in a second. Yes. Uh, in this case, you need both of them, and this is the assumption that we're going to break in just a second. Yes. Because um, that's true entanglement. It will, it will still depend. I will see. I actually have a really nice example, but that's a great question. So in this case, you know, we revisit these three examples, and I will show you examples where we see that this is not generally true. Like I have, I can have deep circuits, but if I have deep circuits and my algebra is small, you know, this doesn't necessarily have to be exponentially small. I can actually have a lot of standard entanglement in my initial state so long as the generalized entanglement is not small. And those two are not necessarily correlated. And global operators, if I have a measurement of an operator that is in the algebra and is global, that's all fine. The problem is that before, whenever we had this kind of like local circuits, the notion of the algebra was still associated with those local algebras, right? So everything kind of worked out, but that's generally not true. And I will present explicit examples showing that all of these three are false, but we can already start to see why it is that they are false. So now we show that what is important is not just entanglement and locality or globality with respect to the standard product, tensor product decomposition, is relative to the dynamical Lie algebra. And hence, we can find examples where we can find algorithms that are trainable on highly entangled states and highly global operators. So this is the summary of the first part. We had this previous sources of Bernal plateau, like the expressiveness of the circuit, the entanglement in the initial state and the measurement operator. And those are generalized to generalize entanglement and locality and the dimension of the algebra. And we can, you know, kind of trivially include spam and measurement, spam noise at the beginning and uh, end of the circuit. And this guy is just changing the amount of generalized entanglement. This guy is just changing the amount of generalized locality. So we can start to include noise. So uh, what is the intuition for why entanglement induces parentheticals? Can you repeat the question, sorry? What is the intuition for why entanglement induces parentheticals? So in the standard sense, it was because we thought about this kind of like local circuits where you were just looking at subsets of qubits. So if you had states that are very entangled, I, tr I do the marginal states, and those are very close to being maximally mixed. So whenever a gate tried to act on that reduced state, it's essentially doing nothing. Uh, but here we can see that that's not the case. It's like entanglement relative to the algebra. So it was kind of because you like, assumed that you were looking at local observables. Exactly. And this is what, because the papers that were out there were usually looking at local observables with local circuits. And this is why kind of we thought that maybe just entanglement was an issue. But that's not necessarily the case. This is just because of the circuits that we were working with. But you can go to other circuits, and entanglement is perfectly fine. So I guess that with this, you know, that's a wrap. Baron Plateaus is done. I'm just going to go home. But of course. As we already said, we are making some assumptions here, like the measurement operator and the states have to be in the algebra. So while we made this generalization here, which allowed us to obtain and unify sources of Baron plateaus under this one formalism, we still have this assumption that we would like to get rid of. So this is the paper that we submitted today to the archive. Uh, it's going to appear tomorrow because we missed the deadline by two minutes. So we're going to have to wait an extra day for it to get out. But we're really happy because what we're able to do is go beyond the dynamical Lie algebra at the cost of, for now, going again to just study one specific architecture. But we hope that the lessons that we've learned here are going to help us to now go to a more general theory. So we're going to consider parameterized match gate circuits, which are, again, these guys right here. If you do the nested commutators, you'll find that the algebra is just composed of these operators right here. 
you can see that definition of those guys. And again, before we had this assumption of the measurement operator or the initial state in the algebra. And uh, dynamically, the algebra was the central element. Now we need to expand this definition and think about group modules. So what is a group module? Is now I'm calling B the whole operator space. And the operator space in this case is gonna decompose into a direct sum of two to the n plus one subspace. This is their dimension. And the thing about those subspaces is that if I take an operator that belongs to each one of those and I apply an element of the group, it's gonna still belong here. So those are what are called group modules. And this is actually quite easy to prove because you take this algebra right here, you use Jordan and Wigner, you define the associated Majorana operators, and for instance, you can see that the dynamical Lie algebra is composed of products of two Majoranas. And each one of those modules is going to be now composed of products of kappa distinct Majoranas, and this is why this is the dimension that I have, because I have two to the n total Majoranas. Fun fact, for instance, like the parity operator that appears in free fermions is just a product of all the Majoranas. So this provided us a nice framework where we can control and understand exactly how the group acts on the operators and how this divides into subspaces. And now these are going to be the central elements, the modules. If we go ahead and carry the calculation of the variance, we need to do a little bit of Weingarten calculus, but we get to this really nice equation here. So what is it that we have now? So what we have is that the expectation value is composed of the first two modules. This one contains the identity, this one contains the parity. So again, it's the abelian component, no surprise here. And then the variance is going to be divided into a sum over the modules. And this is kind of nice because we see this term right here that appear, which are the same k purities, kappa purities that we had before. We've got this dimension and we've got this kind of new term here, which are the covariances, which we can interpret as coherences. And we can see exactly why it is that we interpret those guys as coherences. And we use this notation just because it's very convenient to define, to define both of them in terms of some um, modified inner product with either the identity or the fermionic parity operator. So for instance, if we have an operator that belongs to a given module, which is not the zeroth or the two nth, we're gonna have expectation value equals to zero. And a formula that resembles the one that we had before. And actually, if this is the second module, which is the algebra, we recover exactly our previous result. But if we have a different module, what's really nice is that now we can see that we have this coefficient right here. And that is not the dimension of the algebra. It's not even a polynomial function of the algebra. It's like 2n taken out of 4 has nothing to do with 2n taken out of 2. They're not directly related. So what we see is that the local measure, expressiveness measure of the dimension of the algebra was replaced by this more global expressiveness dimension, which is this one right here. And for instance, there is a module that is of dimension 2n choose n. That is exponentially large. It kind of has to be, right? Because operator space is 4 to the n dimensional, and I only have 2 to the n plus 1 modules. Some of them are bound to be exponentially large. This is one of them. So we can see that even if I have a circuit whose dynamical Lie group has a Lie algebra that is polynomially small, I can still move in a very large vector space. So even if I have very small expressiveness, I am moving in a very large vector space, and this will induce a problem. And again, the expressiveness of the dynamical Lie algebra is locally, tangent plane, where I'm moving. Now you can think about just the Heisenberg picture. I take my measurement operator, and I start moving it around with my algebra, with my group, along this vector space, and this can be very, very large. So locally, I still only have dmg different directions. Globally, I can move in this dimension vector space. So the conjecture that we have, it's true if the operator belongs to the algebra or the, or the initial state belongs to the algebra, but now we can see that a circuit that was trainable, it can be not trainable. It's now module dependent, so it's not the dimension of the algebra that matters. And we can now pretty cool define a generalized, of, a generalized notion of globality where I take two Majoranas, multiply them together, three Majoranas, four, and this is the different modules, and the more Majoranas I have, I call this the more global the operator is. And we can see that if I measure something that belongs to a module that is order one, I take this modulus n because there is parity symmetry. So for instance, 2n taken out of one is the, n, the same as 2n taken out of 2n minus one. And that's the parity symmetry, so this is why I need to take modulus n. So if I take very local operators in terms of Majoranas, I have no barium plateaus. But if I take product of a lot of Majoranas, then I will be in very large modules and I will have barium plateaus. 
And what's really cool about this is that we were able to take those purities and rigorously connect them with measures of fermionic entanglement. There was a lot of reading to be done in the fermionic community because ultimately we have qubits. We are working with the quantum circuit. In qubits, sure, we have the match gate circuit, but the fact that in our formula, in our formula, we proved that this guy right here is an actual measure of fermionic entanglement. Fermionic in the actual fermionic sense, right? So we provide operational meaning to these guys. And now we can connect this notion of the variance is proportional to how much fermionic entanglement I have. And again, we have qubits, but you have proper fermionic entanglement measures appearing in our formulas. And these covariances, uh, it's really nice because they appear between isomorphic modules and those are related to parity sectors. And this is actually something that JP Morgan says at the end of their paper that if one were to construct a general formula, you need to expect that there's gonna be covariances from isomorphic modules. And this is exactly what's happening here. Uh, sorry, I lost the train of thought a little bit. So where did the Majorana for operators come from? from Just the, the fact that we have a match gate circuit. And I started with the match gate circuit. All of this is for match gate circuits. All of this is exclusively for match gate circuits, yes. So this is why we get like fermionic measurements because we, they have an underlying free fermion Lie algebra. So uh, this is all really nice. That was a lot of theory, but I also wanted to show some cool numerics. So what happens if I take a Gaussian state? This is the one that has the largest G purity in the algebra. And I start taking a, operators that have increased standard globality. So Z1, Z1, Z2, Z1, Z2, Z3, and they belong to this module. And you can see that as I start increasing the module that I belong to, this kind of goes down. And if I just fix a module and increase n, it's gonna go down exponentially when the number of operators grows with n. But what's really cool is that, for instance, if we take this guy right here, this is z1 all the way to zn minus one. This is a very global operator in the standard sense. And yet, it's super trainable. So you can think about this curve is the same if I measure z1 or if I measure Zn minus one, Z1 all the way to Zn minus one. So this is super global operator and super trainable for this initial state. Then we were considering magic states and magic in this fermionic sense where there's been maybe like five or six papers in the last two months studying this thing that they call extent, which is a generalized version of magic for fermionic states. And they found that this kind of state uh, has exponential amount of extent. So it's a state that has a lot of quantum resources. So we can take this state, we can, and of course those dashed lines are exact theoretical calculations, the points are just numerical calculations. And let's take a measurement uh, that is in the algebra, and let me just take and change the amount of fermionic resource that I have, and I can see that as I have more resource, the variance kind of just goes down. Is there one missing in the last kit? There is a one missing in the last one. It's, it's all one, correct. Uh, yes, this is all ones. And this is the paradigmatic state that the fermionic community has been analyzing us. Like this is as entangled as it gets. It has exponential extent for any parameter tau not different than zero. Then we can also take non-fermionic states, which is something that uh, I was talking to some collaborators that do fermions and I mentioned non-fermionic states and they're like, doesn't exist. And I was like, I can do this, no, no, non-fermionic states doesn't exist, they mix parity, but in this case, I don't really care about that, and I can see that if I take, yeah. It's non-fermionic only in the sense that you get a superposition of different parity sectors. That, yeah, this is a superposition. Minus the parity superposition. I'm sorry? Minus the parity superposition. Yeah, if you have fermionic systems, but that's true, but this is just, uh, I can do yeah, whatever I want. Yeah, that's why it was like, kind of like raking their brains a little bit. Um, here, uh, N minus one should be here. Yeah, so I did those lights yesterday after like the poster session and a couple of beers, so there's bound to be a couple of errors. Uh, I'm sorry, no beers, camera. So if I take an operator which is completely local, so x, j, so I just measure x on the first qubit, second qubit, and so on, you can see that now I can have local measurements that have exponentially vanishing gradients if they belong to one of the exponentially large modules, right? So it's not about locality, it's about what module I belong to. So it's about this generalized notion of locality. So something that is kind of cool is that if I take this circuit, this measurement belongs to the algebra. I send Gaussian state, super trainable. If I measure this guy right here, belongs to exponentially large module, very barren plateau. 
but I can map between those two with a single rotation. So I can take a circuit at a single rotation at the end, which is going to be a rotation around the y-axis, and I can transform a completely trainable circuit in a completely untrainable one. And again, because this is very counterintuitive, but it's all related to the algebraic properties of my quantum circuit. So we're really happy with this because what we're able to do is take and take the first step towards uh, Lie algebraic analysis that kind of breaks the assumptions that I need to belong in the algebra. And we hope that we can have a theory where any quantum circuit, any measurement operator, any initial quantum state, we're going to be able to understand Baron plateaus. And we kind of present these new notions that one way or another, we think that they should appear in whatever formulation we have. So just to say that these results are kind of important to me because I've been thinking about Baron plateaus for a while now. It's been almost five years since I've been just like obsessing about Baron plateaus and being able to just take a bird's eye view and starting to see the patterns merging has been really nice. And I have to give a lot of props to my collaborators and to also the JP Morgan team and people that are interested in this problem. And just to wrap up, here are some of the things that, that I wanted to, for you to take away. I really feel like we were at, at a point where we've witnessed a transformative shift in our understanding of barium plateaus. And what's really nice is that those, why do we think those are useful? Because we want to start guiding the design of models that, you know, I don't know if they're going to be trainable. I don't know if I can reach the global minima. I might get stuck in a local minima, but at least I know that I will be able to train. You know, I'm going to be able to take the first optimization step, which is a necessary, but of course, not sufficient condition for the model to be useful. So now, if you find an algebra that is polynomially large, which is a good sign, we can also start to understand, OK, you want to do data encoding? Maybe don't encode in such a way that you're going to get a lot of generalized entanglement and whatnot. And here are some open questions. The first one, and this is the one that I'm the most intrigued about, and I think that this was mentioned in both Jen's uh, talk, that there seems to be, at least in the match gate circuit, we can relate trainability to fermionic entanglement. But fermionic entanglement is a computational resource. You can use this to promote match gates to universal circuits. So we see that at this point, every model that is trainable, we have been able to find a way to classically simulate it. And trainable in the sense that we have provable trainability guarantees. So even with this uh, exponential extent circuit, this is what people in the fermionic literature are saying that this is the most not simulable possible. But we saw that in that curve, there's some regime where it was trainable. Yeah? But is it like a common cause? Or do you just happen to have very few parameters in both settings? I mean, so it might be. I don't think it's just about the number of parameters, because for different circuits that are trainable, we have found different simulation strategies. So it's not like one unique strategy. There just seems to be some vague connection happening there. And for instance, with those states with exponential fermionic, those guys are saying those are exponentially hard to simulate. And we were like, but those are trainable. So how can they be trainable and not simulable? And we actually found a way, because of those states, to simulate them. So we had to find a new simulation algorithm, which is in like page 25 of the appendix, which no one is ever going to find. But it's because we're not using weak theorem, right? And this is what people that do condensed matter and fermionic systems, everything goes through weak theoretical and weak base simulation methods. But if you break that, we can take those exponentially large extent states and simulate that quantum algorithm. We don't know what it means, but it was kind of fun that it was raking our brain, and we realized that the simulation technique is like trivial. It's like shamefully trivial. So the question is, is this connection between trainability and classical simulability more general? And I'm putting an asterisk here because we might need a quantum computer to get a classical description of my quantum state. So I might need to do classical shadows or tomography and then send it through a classical version of my circuit. So this is why I'm putting an asterisk here. Then the next question, what about noise during the circuit? If I have noise, I no longer have groups. If I don't have groups, I don't have Lie algebras, all falls to the ground. Can we understand what is a general theory of Baron plateaus that actually includes noise during the circuit? This is still an open question that I would like to see. What about shallow depth? We need deep enough circuits so that you're converging to being a two design over your lead group. But if that's not satisfied, can we have Baron plateaus? Like QAOA, QAOA, we know that for most graphs, deep versions of QAOA will have Baron plateaus, guaranteed, unless you have the path or the circle graph. Every other possible graph will have Baron plateau. But two or three or four or five layers, QA, it's trainable. But what can we say about that in general? 
And what happens whenever we have cost functions which are not based on expectation values? What happens if we have like sampling problems? I feel like maybe Zoe's group has been the only one that has taken a couple of steps in, in trying to find what are the costs that we should train, the ones that we shouldn't train, or what do we know about circuits? Like, does the Lie algebra play an important role in generative modeling? I don't know. Maybe someone here can prove it. I actually should stop saying this because someone will prove it. <laughs> so maybe just forget about all of this. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and thank my collaborators. Uh, specifically, I want to give a big shout out to Michael. He has been our Lie algebra and representation theory expert. I've learned so much from him. And he's actually finishing his PhD and looking for a job and sitting in the audience. So you know, if you're looking for someone, you're like, I should get into this. He's literally the guy that wrote the tutorial that we have on representation theory. So you know, go and hire him. And for the students, the applications for quantum computing summer school are going to be open in just a few months, uh, in November probably, not just a few months, next month. So stay tuned. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>